Life is fragile. In the story we heard from the Gospel of John today, it follows the story of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And if you don't remember that story, it's the story of Lazarus has died. And while he was sick, his sisters had sent for Jesus to come and heal his friend. And he was busy. Went on his way, but busy. And while on his way, Lazarus died. And while he was in the distance, one of the sisters runs up to Jesus and says, how could you not come when we called? How could you not come and help Lazarus? And then the other sister came up, again crying out, how could you not help my brother? And Jesus wept. And then Jesus shows us that death does not have to be the final answer. That death does not have to be the end of the story. And he walks into that tomb where Lazarus has been placed and brings him out. And then we get to our story. And people are having dinner together. But the smell of death is in the room. Because after dinner, Mary breaks open one of the perfumes, one of the oils that they use to make sure that your loved one is cared for as they make their journey to the other side. She breaks it open and washes Jesus' feet. She washes his feet, bathes it with her hair, And during that act, the smell of death is in the air. And Judas, who we know is going to do horrible things in just a couple chapters. In this moment, says, how could you do that? How could you take something worth so much and break it open and pour it on his feet? We could have used that money. Now, I will say in the other Gospels, it doesn't say he stole it. This Gospel says he was upset because now he couldn't use the money for his own purposes. But it brings up a question about fragility. Within that dinner party, they have already experienced death. They've already experienced great loss, but now, now in the moment after that experience of seeing that Lazarus is no longer dead, they get to think about what does death mean? How do we deal with that grief and sorrow that has went from Jesus weeping to them celebrating and having a party? And then Jesus speaks about fragility. He says, You will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. translators make choices, right? So when they decided to translate that, you will always have the poor with you. They made a choice that put it into sort of the, uh, made it seem like something that always happens and will always be there. But in the actual words, in the original language, it can be a command. 
instead of you will always have the poor with you, it is you will always be with the poor. Speaking about the fragility of life, that wherever we are, there are always going to be poor with us. There are always going to be people that are right on the edge. That life is fragile. That a broken car, a trip to the emergency room, a lost job, puts people on the edge of poverty and throws them into a place where life becomes hard and dangerous. And if Jesus says to us as a command, you will always be with the poor, then that changes how we look at people's lives, right? Instead of the poor are going to be there and you just need to worry about me now, which is what we hear, right? It becomes an encouragement, a command to do something about the poor. Because this passage, this passage is reminding them who are aware of their own scriptures that in Deuteronomy there is a passage that talks about how the earth is fragile. That the earth is fragile and there is times at which we need to think about what is happening amongst us. The passage in Deuteronomy comes as, a, as an understanding of the Jubilee practices, that there is going to be poverty created. But God wants you to know that poverty shouldn't be the last answer. That poverty should be used by us and transformed by us every so many years. So in some years, that means that all debts are wiped out in the 50th year. In some years, it means that things are resettled. <clears throat> that if you've been a slave, and in this case, it meant that you lost all your wealth and now are working for someone else, not you are owned for your entire life. <clears throat> that moment in time, that period in time, is not permanent and should not be permanent. And God requires that we take that, we transform slavery and release those who are bound. And so the people who are hearing Jesus say, you will be with the poor always. Hear Deuteronomy and the command to remember that life is not meant to be bound by poverty. That we are to share what we have and transform things. They are remembering that Jesus came not just to show us that their life after death, but to show us that we are to live a life that changes how we are now. In speaking of his own death, he is reminding us of what he did with his life. That in his life, he went among those who were the most left out in society. Those who were pushed out and pushed away. Those who were in need of healing, but were thrown to the side of the road to beg for scraps. He went to those who were seen as dishonorable and unworthy and invited them to dinner. And those actions of bringing healing to the sick, of eating with the outcasts, of arguing that poverty should not exist, are the very things that he knows will be leading to trouble in the next few weeks. Those are the acts that the government and the religious leaders find problematic. And yet Jesus does them anyway and says to us, you 
will be with the poor. That you will act the way I have acted. You will comfort them. You will heal them. You will help them find food to eat. You will challenge the structures of government that make this inevitable. And we think about that. Because we did a great big experiment last year in the United States. We decided that we would see if we could transform poverty. And so we gave money. We increased SNAP benefits to every family that had children. We increased the earned child tax credit. And we brought a lot of people, not all, a lot of people out of poverty that we know that we can change our structures of government and change how the poor live in this society. And we did it. And then we decided that, no, that just isn't who we are. Or some of us decided that. 49 senators and two decided that. But poverty, as Jesus said, isn't inevitable. It may always exist because there are always going to be things that bring people to the brink of trouble. There are always things that are going to lead to us recognizing that life is fragile. But we, who follow Jesus, know that we can do something. We can be there when people are feeling fragile. We can be a place of comfort. But we can also be a place that tries to change things. Like, I don't know how many of you follow United Church of Christ news. But in the last three years, the United Church of Christ has removed millions of dollars of medical debt from people. Congregations, small and tiny like us, have given $100 or $1,000 and had that multiply so that your $100 become $1,000 worth of medical debt relief. That there are things that we can do that change how people experience poverty. We can provide the comfort for when people are hurting. And we can fight for the changes that will make the system better. We can remember that in the fragility of life, Jesus wept with them. That when Mary and Martha were full of pain and grief, it is one of the only times in the gospel that we hear that Jesus cried in their midst. When they knew that life was fragile, Jesus welcomed the gift. He didn't shame her for a gift. And we as the church are to do the same. We're to weep with those who need comfort. We are to be present with those who need us on their side. We are to hear Jesus' words. You will always have the poor among you. You may not always have me, but you can be with them. You can be in their midst. Amen.